Welcome back into Links and Locks, Action Network's golf betting podcast presented by Bet365. I'm your host, Roberto Arguello of Action Network, and I'll be joined every Wednesday here by my co-host, Spencer Aguiar and Nick Bretwish. Today, we'll be previewing the course at the Zozo Championship, and we'll be covering a wrap-up from last week's Shriners Children's Open. We'll do a quick course preview and then bring you our best bets, talk about some more outrights, and then if we have any other exotics like matchups and place bets, we'll share those as well. Unfortunately, we won't have any miss the cut bets because there is no cut this week. And then we'll do a brief look ahead to the CJ Cup next week as the tour goes from Japan all the way to South Carolina. Unfortunately, Nick Bretwish will not be with us this week, but he'll be back in action next week. So it's just Spencer and me. Welcome in, Spencer. Uh, big week for you with the tour in Vegas last week. You got to see Jason Day in person. What was that event like for you? It was an exciting tournament. I followed the Jason Day, Ricky Fowler, Taylor Pendrith group around pretty much throughout the entire morning. I thought, damn, you can see it from a statistical perspective. His numbers look brilliant throughout the entire week. Like you could even just tell like the ball striking for him was fantastic. Uh, I was surprised he was out driving Taylor Pendrith off the tee on a lot of holes. And you know, Pendrith has some good distance to him. So that was a pleasant sight to see there. I thought Ricky Fowler was a little all over the place. You know, I kind of Interestingly enough, think he's a unique play this week. I don't know in what capacity necessarily. Like I have him as a first round leader bet. I don't know if I trust him over four days. Maybe for DFS, Ricky can be at least included into that mix. But it was a good tournament. Like obviously, Tom Kim is the truth. Like from a metric standpoint, we kind of all see that with how we're building our models. Um, I think any single time he gets a course where it's not so distance heavy. Like he's going to be a threat and like, mm. he looked really good. I watched him for a little bit. I walked away from the day group for a very short period of time. And uh, Kim's ball striking was just spectacular out there. So good for him to get his second victory. Uh, Patrick Cantley is another horse for the course there that every single year he seems to perform unfortunate for him for how he played 18. But uh, as far as like the betting week goes for me, difficult tournament. I had mentioned that before on the show. These early like swing season events, for whatever reason, whether it's because from a modeling perspective, like the stats are too new, there's corn fairy guys. It's always a slow build for me when I start these cards of mine. So uh, unfortunately, it was a minus 2.1 unit week for me at the Shriners. But, uh, you know, we'll we'll get back into the swing of things. And I think like um, we'll talk about it a little bit if you'd like. But there was a head to head bet that I had last week that just was like a disaster finish on Friday, which we had kind of mentioned it on the show. And then everything came to fruition late to have a push there. So that was unfortunate. That's kind of like those little swings that you can't encounter if you like are losing as it is. Which matchup was that Spencer? Uh, that was Wyndham Clark uh, plus a hundred over Nick Taylor. And that was a bet that was winning the entire time. Like Nick Taylor had dropped to the bottom of the leaderboard. And I had mentioned on the show, like if you could find a different opponent against Nick Taylor, you might be in a more robust long-term situation because my model had miscut potential in both directions with it. And it was just much more like Taylor was the most overrated golfer on my model. Uh, Wyndham Clark was a guy who had some volatility to him, but I thought even if we had like that miscut, miscut battle in Sue, I would probably be able to get on the right side of it just from a metric standpoint from the way I was running it. And it looked like with going into 17, and I mean, this is even when it was like a three shot lead going into 17, there was points of the week where, I mean, Clark was up by six, seven, eight strokes, and it kind of just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And it got to 17. He was up three, he bogey 17, which can be a difficult hole. So it's like, okay, he goes to the final hole, hits an errant tee shot. Then he has to take a penalty on his next shot. He ends up making double bogey mm -hmm. and it's a push. So a bogey, double bogey finish ends up going miscut, oh. miscut for a push across the board. And when, as I said, when you're already like behind the eight ball, little losses like that really add up. And, you know, like I wasn't able to get out of the hole that I had created early in the week. Well, we started the podcast on a heated the first three weeks, a little bit of a setback there for you. Um, I had a really short card last week. I only had two outrights and then one top 20 um, cash, the top 20 with Matthew Neesmith. Didn't think he was a great statistical fit for the course, but we've seen him play this course really well. And he almost had, he had a chance to win he did. Not a great chance on the back nine, but he still found his way in for a backdoor T T two. Um, so stress-free top 20 hit for Matthew Neesmith there. Um, and so we'll try to keep that momentum rolling in to Japan this week. 
as you mentioned, Tom Kim, in case people, the viewer or the listeners didn't get to watch, Tom Kim and Patrick Cantley were tied up for 71 holes going on to the last hole. Tom Kim puts his ball in the fairway. Patrick Cantley hooks a three wood and puts it in the brush in the desert, has absolutely no lie. He's got three strokes ahead of Matthew Neesmith, who's in the clubhouse at 21 under par uh, in third place solo. And he says, hey, I'm going to try to go get this out of the brush, pop it into the fairway, then give myself a chance to get up and down instead of taking it unplayable and trying to get it up and down from about 170 yards in the brush. Um, I think it was the right decision, trying to go for the win. I admire it, not trying to play for second. Uh, couldn't get out of the out of the desert, ends up taking another unplayable, hits that unplayable into the water, hits his next shot onto the green 40 feet away and makes his longest putt of the week to tie for second. Dramatic finish there. Um, I don't think there are any second place markets out there, but if you did have one big win for you on Catley, getting up and down. Um, unfortunate finish for him, but it was a fun tournament. The back nine was awesome. Um, and hopefully we can keep the momentum rolling another great tournament this week with a much more top heavy field at Narashino Country Club in Chiba, Japan. Uh, Spencer, any initial thoughts on the course this week? Yeah, I do. So it's going to be just under 7,100 yards, par 70 bent grass greens. Uh, I mentioned this on the show last week, but the venue features what I would call a very claustrophobic design off the tee because of the substantial tree line nature of the setup. Golfers will be asked to move the ball in multiple directions because of the dog legs throughout, which means accuracy will take the top spot over distance for the event. Uh, that answer was probably naturally assumed when you heard a sub 7,100 yard course. But I do want to note that driving distance can play a factor here because of the three per long par fives between 562 to 608 yards, plus the five par fours that stretch over 485 yards. There's some rain that's come into play. I mean, that also is going to add into distance. I think all of those hidden areas make it a little bit more difficult to score. It's, you know, it's why only three players last year broke double digit totals. I think all those answers are relatively straightforward, but the issues start coming into play from there because of the lack of trackable data at the venue. I'm someone that builds my model to mimic these courses as much as possible. So it's one of those weeks where not only do we lose the miscut equity that I look for on head to head play since it's a no cut event, but we also don't have the data that I would care to implement into my research process. I will very quickly go through my model and discuss what I did attach a weight to the week since I do believe it's crucial to highlight what I'm looking at during a tournament that will have open ended interpretations, interpretation, sorry to it, but I started with strokes gain total at short par 70s with average to difficult hit fairways for 15% and then 12.5% on average to difficult scoring at short courses. Essentially, those two metrics are trying to mimic past historical trends that we can dive deeper into for the week. Uh, think of this as me trying to highlight similar venues when we don't have enough data to feel comfortable with the track. I did a recalculation of the scoring ranges, so that would be weighted par 3 for 10%. Weighted par four for 20% and par five birdie or better for 10%. 12 golfers in this field ranked in the top 30 in each of those categories. Most of those are going to be names that you're going to expect, but to quickly run through them, they were Hideki Matsuyama, Colin Morikawa, Sungjae Im, Tom Kim, Cameron Young, Tommy Fleetwood, Terrell Hatton, Siwoo Kim, Cam Davis, Mark Hubbard, and a surprising Ricky Fowler there. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why I am willing to go back to Ricky Fowler this week. Um, I highly emphasize all metrics that would try to prevent mistakes. So that would be your bogey avoidance, your scrambling, your sand save percentage around the green and a few others. I mixed all of that together for 17 and a half percent. And then I wrapped it up with a weighted off the T plus approach for 15%. Uh, that's probably in fairness, more of a ball striking geared towards, I want to say accuracy. It's a 65, 35 split of accuracy over distance. I then took that total driving number, merged it in with GIR percentage. That's how I get the ball striking number. I added that into the weighted proximity because we don't have long-term data to look into. That's something that's at least noteworthy. Like I am, I guess, speculating would be the best word of where I think second shots are going to come from. Put all of that together, ran a model. Uh, top seven of that model yielded Sung J M, Tommy Fleetwood, Xander Shoffley, Tom Kim, Hideki Matsuyama, Colin Morikawa, and Cam Young. So you see a very straightforward pricing set. I mean, maybe a different order as far as what the books have out there. But I mean, the top seven for me are pretty much the top seven for Vegas. 
uh, maybe outside of Fleetwood, who might be a couple spots lower than that, but even still, he's a top 10 guy. So uh, I'm kind of in unison and walking in step with the sports books right now. And that makes it difficult to win. We don't have a cut and we don't really have an edge of what we're looking for. So it's a very minimal card for me. It's not my favorite tournament. Uh, I am taking a very aggressive approach on the outright side of things, but uh, what did you notice about the venue, Roberto? So like you said, it's frustrating not having as much data as we'd like. Uh, as we know, there have been three Zozo championships, but only two have been played in Japan uh, because of the COVID pandemic in 2020. This event was played in Thousand Oaks, California at Sherwood Country Club. Uh, so we do have data on that tournament, but it's irrelevant for this week, really. Um, the two winners at this course when it's been played in Japan, Tiger Woods and Hideki Matsuyama, incredibly strong um, players on approach. And as you said, it's going to be smaller greens. There's going to be more of an emphasis put on driving accuracy than distance off the tee. And I think that that favors a player who has the elite approach game and might not necessarily be the best putter in the world. Um, and so I'll just go ahead and get into my first best bet uh, and my favorite outright play this week. And that's Colin Morikawa. Uh, Spencer, you mentioned last week on our quick look ahead that he was the guy you'd be looking at when odds dropped on Monday. Um, and the data doesn't necessarily indicate how great he is on approach. I would say just because last year he had that strange occurrence where this guy who's played a fade his entire life, it's his bread and butter, he's playing a draw. And it was his first year on the PGA Tour where he didn't get a win after winning in each 2019, 2020. Uh, and 2021, but in, in the 2022 season, didn't get a win. But he didn't have a terrible year either. He still made it to the PG, or to the Tour Championship. Um, he still also had a 36-hole lead at the U.S. Open. And if there's a, a tournament on the PGA Tour where it's hard to hide any weaknesses, it's the U.S. Open every year. Um, had a really bad Saturday, but still overall is a guy who, when he plays his best, I don't think there are any. There are more. I don't think there are more than five players in the world who could beat him. Um, and when I say he plays his best, I mean his irons are in form, and his putter is not an absolute disaster, uh, because we know he's not a strong putter. But I think on these greens, um, which are smaller, they actually have two greens on every yes. hole, uh, so that whenever the weather is in whichever situation it is, there will be an ideal green for the players to play. Uh, so that makes it interesting. They're smaller greens, so less of an emphasis on putting because it'll be fewer lag putts more around the green game. Um, I'm excited about Colin Morikawa. This is his first PGA Tour tournament this new season. He did play in the President's Cup and his iron form looked really strong there. So I'm willing to take a shot at him. It's out there at 16 to one. And in a field without a ton of great players, there is, as you said, a seven elite players at the top, but there's not that much depth in this field. And with only 78 players, no cut, a lot of these guys traveling out to Japan after playing in Vegas last week and playing a couple weeks before that, Morikawa was fresh after playing uh, in the President's Cup three weeks ago. I really like, I really like him. And I am worried that if he is back in form with the Irons, this is the chance you got to take uh, to get him at this number. Cause if he wins, you're not going to see 16 to one in this kind of field going forward. And also we know on the fall swing, um, if I might add these guys who are at the top of the PGA tour, like Morikawa, they pick and choose their spots. They're not playing every week. Like a lot of the guys coming off the corn freight tour. And it says something that he wants to play this week and he's going all the way to Japan to play in it. And in his uh, two starts here, he's finished tied for 22nd and tied for seventh. Um, so I like it. And as you said, five par threes on this course, put a little bit more emphasis on approach. Um, and then uh, it'll be fun just to watch this tournament with par fives. I think on, on the back nine on, on 14 and on 18, always love a par five on the finishing hole. Yeah. And just to add a couple of things to what you mentioned here. So this is a challenging course. Like I, I don't know if you have a winning score in mind, Roberto, of what you think it's going to be like. I mean, if you made me guess, I would say, I guess, sub 15 under like I, I could see this being maybe when you say 15 between, like between uh, um like I, I would say 10 like under I'll par be, between 10 and 15 not like 20 under par yeah I would say between gotcha. 10 to 15 under par would probably be my projected and maybe 10 is going like too low with it um 
I guess That's like about the range I had as well. And, and what ends up happening there, and it's a really interesting thing to note, hard courses means that putting is reduced. That's mm-hmm. going to give a higher emphasis on ball striking. Uh, you know, like your players that can't make a putt, and you're, granted, you're going to have to be able to putt a little bit uh, to win a tournament, yes. but like players that are more neutral with the putter for the week, like even if Morikawa can be around zero, I think that the ball striking can be good enough for him if he doesn't need to do it. You have, you know, high end metrics are going to be needed. So whether you want to look for guys that are really good with their irons, which is, you know, the PGA tour in general is kind of a second shot tour. I think that like a lot of those guys that are good with their iron play and you can wait it for a specific course on it. And Morikawa is the number one player in my model when looking for way to proximity, you could look at him at most any course and it's going to be one of the top players uh, that you can find. But what I'm getting at here is any time that you have a no cut tournament, you need those high end metrics to come into play. So whether that's looking at approach play or it's looking at maybe a player like Cameron Young, which I guess I'll segue into right now. There is going to be some wetness to this course. I do think distance can play an advantage in like one of the ways I would look at it is it's like almost think of, I guess I don't want to necessarily make this comparison because Rory McIlroy is a much better overall driver of the golf ball. But like think of Rory McIlroy at these tree line courses that any single time that he's on that distance holds a really big advantage. So you have three par fives that are difficult. One of them is a 21% birdie or better rate that you're going to find. It's over 600 yards. If Cameron Young can take advantage of that hole, there's five par fours that are going to be over 480 yards. I mean, that's something to keep in mind there. I think accuracy does hold precedence over everything else, but there are holes like eight of the holes are going to give you a driver that has to be hit off the tee. And I think a player like Cameron Young is going to be able to use his distance there. Like his A game versus everyone else. And and by the way, I took Cameron Young at 19 to one on bet three, six, five. But when I looked at his A game and compared it to everyone else, He looks like a 13, 14 to one value in my model. Now, when I take the more conservative route, it does drop him down to like the 2021 range of what you're trying to find here. But I think that the upside is what I'm trying to find. I did reduce my win total. So I usually bet to win at least eight units on these. I'm betting it to win seven units on each one of these players, just because I did take a very aggressive approach at the top. And I know it's something we were talking about off the air. And I mean, maybe we can talk about it right now. This middle tier section doesn't have the value that you're looking for. It's Mm -hmm. a 78 man field. My model seems to be in walk walk step with everything that like these sports books are releasing. And when you're looking at my model and it's like you have Sungjae and Morikawa and Cameron Young and Xander and all these guys kind of holding all the win equity. I didn't want to splurge as much into it. And without the, I guess, if you want to call it like no trackable data, once the event starts, I'm not planning on jumping into this tournament once it is. So I'm kind of just giving my card in a more aggressive approach to begin. So uh, that Cameron Young will be 0.37 units to win 7.03 on him. I'm a big believer in Cameron Young. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if he's played on this course before, um, but I love his game. He's the guy who, it doesn't matter where you're, where the course is, his game travels everywhere. If you're elite off the tee um, and you have solid iron play and he's not a terrible putter either, he's a guy who's going to win a tournament much sooner than later. Um, seeing him at 19 to one kind of yeah, shocking yeah. for me. Um, and I just really want to be on the more in Kawa train. Didn't want to do uh, multiple plays under 20 to one. Uh, although if there was another player that I'd do under 20 to one, it would be Sung J M. I haven't played him yet, but I know you're really bullish on Sung J this week. I am. So the second outright that I'm taking is Sung J M. that's 12 to one at bet three, six, five. And that's kind of going in, uh, with the model that I'm taking of, I'm just taking an aggressive approach at the top and, uh, I'm going to let everything play out from there. And, and I know Sung J as well as the Cameron Young price. Those numbers seem really short when you hear it, but it's important to remember that it's a field of fewer than 80 players. The bottom 17 golfers graded out to have virtually, I mean, like literally, like, I mean, zero win equity. So we already are down to an actual competitive group of 60 golfers. And then my model believes Sungjae should have been the favorite at closer to 10 to one. His form is brilliant with five straight top 15 finishes. And he leads this field with 24 consecutive rounds of shooting par or better. 
Uh, Russell Knox would be second at 20 rounds. Andrew Putnam and Sepp Strocker are at 12 uh, each. Or uh, actually, sorry, Andrew Putnam's at 12. Sepp Straka is at 10. But, you know, that's a really big gap for Sungjae. It shows how well he's playing. And I think that should be considered a vital statistic since he does rank first in this field for bogey avoidance and scrambling. Uh, 0.59 units to win 7.08 there. Uh, so that gets me just a little bit below one unit in total. And a normal week, that would probably be where I stop it. Unfortunately, or fortunately, based off how this is, there was a price in the market that I really liked on a golfer that I rounded my card off with, but it's just one of those events where it's going to be the high end golfers. I'm not going to mess around with everything, anything else with it. And, um, you know, it's not to say that, I mean, I'll throw out a random name here. Um, you know, it's uh, maybe Siwoo Kim is a little bit too, uh, high at 28 to one, but it's like, it, you know, Mito Pereira could win at 40 to one, but I think once we get to like the 40, 50 to one range, maybe 55 to one max, I, once we get past that number, there's not a ton of guys that I'm eager to bet this week. Yeah. There are really a lot of guys once you get past 50 to one, and even in the like high twenties where I'm saying, I didn't expect these guys to be shorter than 50, or at least I'm not used to seeing these guys shorter than 50. And I want no part of them shorter than 50. Um, especially with the elite players at the top, haven't even mentioned Xander Shoffley is the favorite to win this week. Um, I took a, I took some shots on two guys in that kind of mid tier. Uh, I took one on Davis rally at 50 to one. I think he's a guy who has the approach game to be able to win out here. And we saw him take that first round lead uh, just a couple of weeks ago here on the fall swing and fell apart after that. He said he had his worst week ever driving the golf ball um, with Drew last week from the Shriners Children's Open. So maybe he's a little bit fresher, got out to Japan earlier, avoid some of that jet lag. Um, I've seen some elite form from him recently. And if he can just get that driver figured out, or even if he doesn't need to hit the driver every hole, if he just takes three wood, finds a fairway, um, maybe take a Tiger Woods stinger out there. I don't know if anybody's gonna do that, but um, give himself a chance. I like Davis Riley, I'm a believer in him. The floor with that week driving week, uh, a couple weeks ago is a little bit lower than I'd like for it to be in a normal week, but we'll play the outright. Uh, so we don't have to do anything there. I also took a shot on Keegan Bradley at 35 to one. Um, don't love seeing him at 35 to one. Like, you could get him at 40 to one 45 earlier in the week, but I think there's still a little bit of value at 35. Uh, he's always strong on approach and the putter has been coming around for him. Um, he only has one tournament played in so far in the fall uh, this year, but he did finish in a tie for fifth at Sanderson farms, uh, where he gained almost a stroke and a half on the putting greens. And he was really accurate off the tee that week. Uh, and in two, uh, in two, um, times playing the Zozo championship in Japan, he finished tied for 13th and tied for seventh, uh, gained over two strokes on the field in 2020, or it would have been 2019, but the 2020 season, and then gained, uh, 1.6 strokes on the field total, although we don't have the individual breakdowns on how it went putting around the green approach, et cetera. Um, he's shown that he can play well on this course. He's a veteran on the tour. He won't be, um, he'll be familiar with the travel and some of the issues that go with um, traveling around all the way across the world. Didn't play last week. So he's a little bit fresher as well. Um, so I'll take a shot with him at 35 to one a guy who we know on the tour has made some noise and guys like him who have won before and won big events like majors when they get them, they round back into form, you know, they have that upside. And even though he might not be the sexy name, like a Colin Morikawa, I think he's got that win equity and that's what I'm looking for this week. Yeah. Just to touch on both of those players. I know the two of us, maybe compared to almost anybody in this space, we are very bullish on Davis Riley as a prospect. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't have a problem with that. I, I think it's a unique spot to try to get on him. And then Keegan Bradley fits that mold of what we're talking about of a player where if this is a more difficult course and we think putting is reduced, I mean, Keegan, all of a sudden with the ball striking and he's one of the best ball strikers in the world. That's not even like hyperbole mm -hmm. by saying that, like, if you could remove putting from the equation, Keegan is one of the best pure ball strikers that you're going to see. We've seen like Hideki Matsuyama win this tournament for that exact reason before. It's a reason why Colin Morikawa would make sense in this field. Uh, you can make the argument that a, a player like Corey Connors also sees a similar jump just because of the pure mm -hmm. ball striking, but 
Uh, I like your theories on that. And then just to add my final outright that I have, I took Tommy Fleetwood at 35 to one. There are some red flags regarding weighted proximity and off the T plus approach in my model, but 35 to one was an outlier price in the space on a golfer that my model did absolutely love. We know Fleetwood can win when not on U.S. soil, and he ranks first in strokes gain around the green, fifth at short courses with hard hit fairways, and fifth at challenging scoring tracks. You know, anytime it gets more difficult, like think of Fleetwood at open championships and all these venues to where uh, when par gets a little bit closer to even, which we're not going to get too even, but when we're not having these 25 under par shootouts, Fleetwood all of a sudden gets more upside. So that's 0.20 units to win seven. I've considered adding a little bit more on this play before it's done just to get up to like the normal eight units or maybe beyond of what I play. But uh, yeah, that's a really aggressive card for sure. There were a lot of players I considered, but uh, as I kind of said, I had a hard time making a case for anyone above 50 to one. And at that point, I decided to take the ultra aggressive route since it's where most of my win equity was sitting for the event. I like it. And having been to um, the 2018 U S open at Shinnecock Hills, I can confirm uh, Tommy Fleetwood can get it done at tough courses. Uh, that Sunday at Shinnecock, I believe he shot a 63 and Brooks Kepka and Dustin Johnson were battling back and forth for the lead on the back nine and had either had both of those guys faded down the stretch Fleetwood would have actually won. I think DJ ended up finishing behind Fleetwood, but Brooks Kepka was solid rolled in a bunch of 10 footers for par. Yeah and finished with the win in the U.S. Open. Yeah, um, just, just really quickly on that. I added Fleetwood on that night. I don't remember the exact price. I want to say it was like 250 to one. And oh, cool. uh, he's sitting there and it just kept getting like more likely and more likely and more likely. And as you said, Kepka drained every single putt down the stretch mm -hmm. that he needed. And unfortunately, if I recall correctly, I think Fleetwood missed a birdie putt on 18, which is what he would have needed to eventually get himself into a playoff. But uh, yeah, I, I believe he either came solo second or, or tied for second, whatever it was. And uh, he had a chance. And unfortunately, I mean, it would have been a nice ticket to hit, but Brooks was too solid down the stretch there. Yeah, I got to follow that back nine from Brooks. And it was impressive because I've been there 10 footer for par on seemingly every hole and miss it. Uh, so to see him make every single one of those, just incredible. Uh, let's look at some place bets and or matchups. Uh, what stands out this week to you, Spencer? Uh, I mean, I guess let's start with the matchup section and we can have an open discussion here. So it's one of those tournaments that I don't see a need to force action. Maybe something happens late because of a new release or a movement on an original line, but I'm fine treating this as an essential off week in that regard. Uh, the in-tournament information that I keep alluding to will be challenging because of the lack of trackable data. And the pre-event research doesn't seem to be yielding much of an advantage in any market. If you want uh, to rapid fire off some players, I mean, we can have an organic conversation here of players that maybe we are more aggressive or less aggressive on based off of whatever market you want to discuss. But I unfortunately don't have a lot to say for the matchups this week. Okay. Um, I didn't love the matchups either, but I wanted to talk about someone who you mentioned briefly earlier, uh, Mito Pereira. So Mito was someone who I ended up betting on last week, even though we didn't mention it on the podcast to win outright, love his game on approach. And he's been sizzling with his irons recently. Um, if you look at what he's done. So last week gained over two strokes on approach, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and he gained strokes on approach in nine of his last 10 tournaments. So, you know, he's got a really high floor there. Um, I don't, want to bet him to win this tournament because of the putting because of the turnaround uh and because of players like colin morikawa sung J M, cameron young xander shoffley hideki matsuyama at the top of the field um but if i end up watching some of this late night golf being the insomniac that i am maybe we'll throw a live play if we see the putter start to heat up um but i am going to enter this tournament with a play on him for top 20 he's out there at plus 110 um, I like the high floor for him. And I think that with there being a little bit more weakness in the mid tier and the middle bottom, um, of this field, as you said, you can take away about 15 players and make it about a 60 player tournament. So if I, if he's just got to beat 
you just got to be in the top third of those of those 60 players. I'll take my chances at plus 110 with his sizzling irons. Yeah, I tried to figure out a way to get exposure to Mito Pereira this week. I, I like his metrics from an upside standpoint. Now, I don't necessarily like him enough to win. And, and especially when I stack the top of the card, like I don't have any extra room to add anybody at that point. But uh, I bet him at 40 to one to be first round leader. I mean, that's not a market that I love coming on this show to talk about. I think there's a lot of uh, volatility, I guess, would be the best way to say it to a, a market like that. But I bet him, I bet Siwoo Kim, uh, Sebastian Munoz, uh, Ricky Fowler, Aaron Rye, just to throw out some names that uh, popped up off the top of my head there. It's a fun little market to play around with. I do think that in a limited field, there were a little bit more edges that I had just because I think that some of the books were a little under um, a total of what they should have, but I don't know. I mean, it was really hard for me to figure out how to play any of these players. And that's kind of why I'm stuck in a spot right now where I have no head to heads. I have two placement wagers which I guess I'll get into the first one right now, but it's not like a placement card that I necessarily love either. It's a number grab on the first one, just because I thought the price was too high. And the second one is about as like little or as minimal of an edge as you'll ever hear me recommend on a show. And I hate doing that, but when we don't have a ton to talk about to begin with, like we kind of have to dip into some of these lower tiered type wagers. So uh, the first top 40 that I have would be on Satoshi Kodaira to come or at plus 220. I like the price in a 78 man field on a golfer with a couple of intangibles that will suit the course. Well, all the weighted par four uh, proximity that I ran was excellent. He ranked seventh on the challenging par fours and six on the easier ones. The ball striking is very good because of his second place accuracy mark off the tee. The GIR percentage moved him down the little the board a little bit when adding that into the mix, but 13th overall in that category when mixing total driving and GIR percentage. Uh, inside the top 12 for par five birdie or better percentage. Now I realize I'm cherry picking the numbers where he grades well, because there are surely a handful of categories where he ranks near the bottom of the field, but that's kind of what you're looking for on these long shot wagers with volatility. Always give me the high end potential when we're getting over two to one on a golfer to beat just half the field. And he's not one of those players that is in that 17 golfer mix that had zero win equity. Like I actually have a little bit of win equity for him. I thought he should have been about 150 to one in this field. So um, you know, take that for what it's worth. And then the one that has the most reduced edge that I've ever given on a show before would be Dylan Fratelli to come top 40 at minus 110. Uh, I like the trajectory that my model has right now with him where the putting is performing better than his two-year baseline. And then the critical scoring metrics for this course are better than his projection at a random stop on tour. So to highlight that a little bit better, Fratelli ranks 11th in this field when playing short courses that my model deemed challenging. And he's also third when recalculating the metrics to look at the complete encapsulation of all par fours. That total is going to compare to 51st in par four scoring over a two year sample size, which means my model does see something in a few areas to believe whatever his normal expectation is, does get enhanced at this venue. So uh, very small edge at the minus 110. I, uh, I bet 0.55 units to win 0 0.5. Uh, the Kadira play, I don't have up in front of me right now, but I want to say it's 0 0.45 to win a unit or whatever that would actually be. So it's a little bit more of a win total there. But, uh, you know, I'm kind of just spreading out a little bit of exposure that's not in an outright market. And I'm probably calling it a day from there. Like it's just unfortunately not a tournament. I see a whole bunch of a reason to get into. I think it's really interesting that you found plays on Kadira and Fratelli. Uh, I pulled up their data golf profiles and one cool little visual they have is uh, like a spider chart uh, where they have five different um, metrics, driving distance, driving accuracy, approach play, around the green and putting all strokes gained relative um, in standard deviations to the tour average. And you can see that Fratelli is well below average in driving accuracy, but at or better average uh, in everything else in the other four metrics. And Satoshi Kodaira is the exact opposite where he is way above average in driving accuracy and below average solidly in the other four categories. So I'm, it's interesting that you can find two players like that um, to play at any time, at any course. Um, it, it's a, but... it's a number grab situation at a venue in my mind where I don't think necessarily 
it's pure distance and I don't necessarily think it's uh, pure accuracy. I think there are a lot of ways that you can go about this venue. And I think if you are elite in any of those areas, which Kadira is top 10 in my model for accuracy and mm -hmm. Fratelli is not inside the top 10 for distance. Although I do know he's a player that when he hits it, he can hit it far. And I think like my number, I have him, I can tell you exactly what I have him. So um, at this tournament, he would be 26 overall. I would say Fratelli's probably longer than that uh, when you actually look at what he's capable of doing. And uh, the Kadira play is purely a number grab. Like, I think it's kind of a wild number. Now, not that I have it way off. Like, I have plus 180 to be a little bit closer to what's proper. But for him to beat half the field and getting over two to one, that really intrigued me. And, and while I know this is not like a DFS show and we're trying to give bets on here, Mm. Uh, there were only two players that were, if you want to say like on the bottom end of the range at whatever range you want to call that, like past a certain point that graded as like profitable type of wagers for me. Uh, one was Hayden Buckley, who everybody in the industry seems to be on this week. Mm. And the other one is Dylan Fratelli, who nobody seems to want to play in any capacity. So I think you can find leverage, whether that be on DFS or you can create some sort of a betting edge. Now, I don't know if that's as a, a top 40 bet, like that's getting really aggressive in the stance or conservative, I guess, if you want to look at it that way in the stance of like, I'm just saying, let's beat half the field. Give me a price on it. Like give me for Telly to beat half the field. Uh, I'll use this as like my quote unquote head to head bet of the week uh, because ties are going to be a problem. I didn't want to go bigger than what I went on it, but uh, that kind of gives some of my thought process of how I ended up on those two. I like it. Uh, once again, shout out to Hayden Buckley shooting that final round seven under at the Sanderson Farms to catch our top 20 a couple weeks ago. He actually finished tied for 20th last week as well. Um, and everyone knows he's really accurate off the tee. Yes. So would seemingly fit this course. Um, and Kadaira also, well, it is on the Japan tour, has three straight top 11 finishes um, in the last three weeks. So hopefully that means he's got a high floor this week. And he's been playing golf in Japan, so he should have somewhat of a leg up on a lot of the competition, just being more familiar. Uh, he also had a T37 finish when this held, was term, this tournament was held in Japan in 2019, so that would have cashed for you. Um, so hopefully he brings that form through once again this week. Uh, any final bets here at the Zozo Championship before we do a brief look ahead to the CJ Cup? No, I mean, that's seriously my entire card. Like I tried to find different markets to get unique with or anything to talk about on this show, but uh, it's two placement wagers. It's my three outrights. And when you build a card in that fashion, I think it's, I mean, unless I hit an outright winner, it's very likely I'm going to come on this show next week and it's going to be like, oh, it was, you know, a losing week, but it's a minimal exposure week at the end of the day where I'm taking mm -hmm. some shots, trying to hit a winner. And this isn't going to be a tournament that breaks the bank for me. And, you know, if a Sung JM or a Fleetwood or a Cameron Young can win, then all of a sudden it turns into a really big week, you know. So uh, I'm just kind of using this as an essential off week, uh, taking my slight edge that I have on my three spots on the outright card and then finding my two spots in a placement bet. But no, it's not going to be a tournament that I, I have a whole ton of exposure to. Should be a fun week with some primetime golf and very late night golf. Uh, and before we get to the CJ Cup, as a reminder, the Links and Locks podcast is proudly presented by Bet365, the world's favorite sportsbook brand. Sign up with promo code ACTION, A-C-T-I-O-N, to get Bet365's exclusive sign-up offer in New Jersey and Colorado. Bet $1 on any game, get $200 free. So looking ahead to next week, the PJ Tour will be going to South Carolina, Congaree Golf Club. Um, this is a course where we were talking before the the podcast. Uh, we're trying to figure out the court, the tours played there, but it's been in some unusual circumstances. Um, this year, one of the most fun tournaments and most fun Sundays was the RBC Canadian Open, and Rory McIlroy defended his title there, but it was a title from 2019 uh, with. COVID issues in Canada, they did not play in 2020 or 2021. And in place of the 2021 RBC Canadian Open, the PGA Tour played the Palmetto Championship at Congaree, and the winner was Garrett Higo, whom we discussed last week. Could be an interesting play this week after he showed some form uh, at the Chicken Championship. Um, so this 
is going to be another tournament at Congaree, this time in the fall swing for the CJ Cup. Um, initial thoughts on the course, Spencer. The first thing that stuck out to me when starting my research was the jarring 7,685 yard measurement. Uh, distance on paper doesn't always equal actual yardage. That's something to keep in mind. Um, I think this tournament this week is a really good example of that. It's less than 7,100 yards, but there are baked in totals that you're going to see as like the par fives I mentioned and the long par fours where driver is going to be hit. But when you look at this particular venue at Congaree, I, I think length might be more prominent than other long venues for that reason. You have wide fairways and virtually no rough. That's going to benefit the bombers. Uh, you have forced carries over waste areas. That only is going to amplify the notion of distance. Uh, greens do appear to be on the larger side of things, which usually diminishes approach flight at least somewhat. And uh, around the green metrics, if you want to add that to the mix too. But I believe Congaree might turn into this bomb and short game contest because uh, at least of what we saw there two years ago, it was firm and fast putting surfaces. It was protected by undulation and bunkers located above and below the greens. Those two factors will enhance sand safe percentage and strokes gain around the green. Uh, I anticipate it being a challenge for all players to get up and down from the wrong area if they missed it the wrong area, I should say. So uh, long iron proximity from 175 plus yards, a weighted distance plus GIR percentage, um, sand safe, as I alluded to. Strokes gain T to green, par five birdie or better percentage. I am going to look at around the greens plus fast slash firm conditions there. But um, I don't know. I mean, I'll dive a little bit deeper into that when we go into it. So like when Higo won there, one of the interesting things to note is with the way I run my model, I always run it from overall uh, and upside, at least as the two main things that I pull from from the end of the week. And there's only been two golfers in the last... I guess it would be the last three years now um, that have ranked outside of the top 65 of my model with the way that I've run it. Uh, Garrett Kigo was one of them. So maybe I need to go back and change a little something based off of that. The other one, just for reference sake would be Phil Mickelson at the PGA championship. Like I think he was 90 something for me. So uh, maybe I missed something in the picture. I do know that at that Paul Meadow tournament, I had a massive wager on Seamus power. That's before Seamus power had broken through and kind of became what he was. And I had a top 40 on him. I had an outright that unfortunately obviously didn't hit, uh, but there was a lot of positive, I guess, metrics that were pulled from him there. So um, I don't know. I, I, it's something that I'll continue to run as time goes on with it, but uh, do you have any takeaways from it past what I said? So Seamus Power was someone who was on the leaderboard there. He finished tied for 19th, who stood out to me. Uh, it also just stood out that there are a lot of players who played in the Palmetto Championship last time we played at Congaree that aren't playing on the PJ yeah. Tour right now, uh, whether that be for Liv or guys who just lost their card. So it's going to be a pretty fresh tournament for a lot of players who don't have experience on the course. So I think it's going to be really interesting. I also have no idea who's going to be in the field just because uh, not sure how many guys are going to travel from Japan to play all the way on the East Coast. Um not quite sure who I want to look for and to bet outside of guys that we discuss more often than not. Taylor Montgomery is going to be an interesting guy, especially if length is uh, a factor, but I don't know that we're going to get a good number on him. I'd love to see him at 40 to one or higher. Uh, last week didn't have him in that range, but thankfully there was a bet 365 uh, odds boost. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, who else here? Um, I'm not quite sure. I'll give a name. Um, he was number one in my model when I ran it uh, the last time it was held at Congaree. And that I, and I don't know how much I love this like cross country trip that he would have to make. Mm -hmm. uh, but Terrell Hatton was number one in my model. I think that's a lot of the short game stuff that propelled him there. So he was number one. I'll, I'll quickly just run through some of these names. He was number one. Uh, Brooks Kepka was number two player that we're not going to be able to get to. Uh, Seamus Power was number three. Um, you know, Alex Noren graded okay. Jonathan Vegas with his ball striking. I mean, these are a lot of players that, as you said, are like, we're not going to be able to uh, play. I'm trying to find anybody that's just like a big outlier here. So um, would, um, any thoughts on Mark Hubbard, the guy who's been playing well, he's played at this tournament before, made the cut, didn't do very well uh, after he made the cut. 
but you had an outright, outright wager on him a couple weeks ago. I don't know. I mean, when I look at my model, he's 54th the last time it was played here. Now he's a different player now. I guess if we go back to somebody that we've been talking about, uh, maybe a Matthew Neesmith. Now I know we keep saying distance and it's a long course, but uh, and Neesmith does not possess any of those qualities, unfortunately, but he still found the way to grade 11th in my model. Maybe it's a spot that we can go back to him. Like a Luke list does have the distance. That's kind of like the same thing with Fratelli and Kadira, where it's going on one end of the spectrum and then quickly going back to the other end of it. Um, you know, Scott Stallings would be an, an, another golfer, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, no, it's, it's obviously tough when we don't know exactly who's in the tournament. And as you said, like, if I'm just looking at my top 20 in general, like even a Pat Perez broke the top 20 for me and uh, Dustin Johnson broke the top 20. So Harold Varner broke the top 10. It's a lot of players that we unfortunately can't get to that my models seem to like. And uh, it'll be unique when I run it, you know, in a couple of days, adding in all the Corn Fairy kids and some of these players who jumps to the top. But um, <clears throat> I guess when we look like it Hatton in particular, he wasn't coming to the venue in such great form uh, the last time he played it. So 38th at the PGA championship, a 39th at the RBC heritage and 18th at the masters. That was his lead into that tournament. Uh, I ran it, uh, 30% as an aggregate of, I guess that would be like my weighted current form metric to it. So like the current form for him, uh, didn't place him in such an outrageous range of what we were looking for. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, Hatton's a guy where I'm curious to see how he performs this week. I'm curious to see how Luke list performs this week. Maybe if there's not too big of an overcorrection to their prices, those might be two guys that I'm at least going to dive a little deeper into. One guy who finished tied for 19th uh, at Congaree a couple of years ago, Bo Hostler, guy who is long off the tee, pretty good putter. You mentioned the big greens. Uh, could potentially help him out as far as course fit. Um, I believe he is playing this week in the field in Japan. So if we see some good form from him, maybe – take a look at some of his greens and regulations since we won't have the strokes gain data um, be someone I'd be interesting to see uh, in how he does not a guy with the super high floor, not a guy who's shown he can close out victories yet on the tour, but somewhere around 125, 150 to one could be worth a nibble. Yeah. I mean, at the right price, everybody is bettable. Like anything that you want to <laughs> place a wager on, if you get the right proper value for it, you can always take a chance with it. So it'll be interesting to see where he enters the market. Um, I, you know, I don't think he necessarily has done enough recently to where it's going to be any different of a number that what you said. So as long as he doesn't like give you one of those second place finishes to where he cuts his number in half, if he can just show you enough to where it's like, oh, it looks intriguing moving forward, uh, you know, over a hundred to one, I think that's where you can take a chance on some of these guys that don't have long-term win equity that they've shown. Someone who I don't believe is in the field this week, we want to bet on all the time. Jason Day showed some form last week. Spencer was following him on Thursday. That might have been the kickstart to get his week going. Finished in the top 10. Actually, did he finish the top five? I think he did. I think he um, did too, yeah. Um, he's someone who, if he is in the field next week at the CJ Cup, I'll be very intrigued to see what the number is. Um, anything over 50 to 1, I think I might take a nibble. Uh, we, we got him at 100 to 1 at the Shriners Children's Open. Not sure that that number will be around, but – in what will likely be a lesser field than normal, just with it being a fall swing, especially with a handful of the top players playing this week in Japan. He's a guy whom I think I will probably bet on. Let's look at the complete encapsulation of proximity numbers over uh, last year and then also over 2021. So, or I guess 2022, like if we count this as the 2023 season. So hmm. uh, Jason Day, is inside the top 15 of my model. Now this is over only a couple tournaments, but he even showed the reason why I mentioned this is not because like I'm cherry picking, you know, a one tournament or two tournament sample size where he's showing something. He also closed the 2022 season with this exact same approach numbers that he's giving you right now. So I think something may have flipped the switch for him. He's inside the top 15 this season in proximity. And when we look at 2022 in overall proximity, he was 172nd in the field. We know he's a golfer. If the back is okay, he carries distance off the tee. I seem to like him at some of these courses where he can bomb and gouge away with it. And, uh, you know, he just needs the putter to be better than it's been. And we know historically Jason Day, as what he was, is one of the greatest short game players uh, that golf has seen. So, uh, I mean, I know that's not going to be a shock me talking about Jason Day on a program, but 
I think there's a lot of upside there and I'm interested to see where the number does come into play. And I hope the market doesn't move too swiftly from what we saw in Vegas, because even when I was running this from just like a ball striking standpoint, and I unfortunately don't have it up in front of me right now, uh, entering Sunday, there were only like six or seven players in the entire field that had gained in every single round, uh, both off the tee and approach. And Jason Day was one of those players. And with the way he closed on Sunday, I didn't run it to see if that included Sunday to the mix. I have to assume it was because he put one of the better rounds yeah. on the course out there. And that's kind of just what he was lacking was the putting. So uh, the ball striking looks really good for him right now. And if that's the case, I, I think we might be like going back into this territory where Day has real win equity. And as you keep talking about, these guys that have shown it in the past, whether it be like in a major, like a Keegan Bradley or a Jason Day, these guys can turn the switch on overnight. And if Day's able to do that, if we can get anything over 50 to one, I will probably be intrigued on that number also. You mentioned next week sets up as a course that could have some bomb and gouge value. And one of the guys who is one of the premier bombers on the tour right now, Taylor Pendrith, you saw firsthand Jason Day was popping it out past him last week in Vegas. Yeah. Uh, so if that back's healthy, which it seems like it's more healthy than it's been anytime recently could be a big time play for us next week. Any yeah, final I, I thoughts? love that. Any final thoughts before we get out of here? No, I, I guess just my one takeaway to everybody listening is just because there's a tournament this week, it doesn't mean you have to go break the bank to play it. Uh, there's different ways to get exposure to a card. And, you know, if you decide you want to sit out the week, there's worse things to do also like only bet when you have value. That's always what I want everybody that's listening to get the biggest takeaway from it is that you never want to force wagers. It's not those spots where, you know, you're down for the week. Let me find a way to put more money on it. Like bankroll management is the number one key for long-term sustained growth when it comes in the sports betting realm. And uh, it's one of the things that I see better is like, I think sports books are built, which yes, it's hard to beat when they already have the built-in edge to begin with. But when you are sporadically changing your units and you're sporadically betting more money than you're able to put down on a wager, that's how you go broke. And the sports book is playing a game that they're trying to make you go broke. If you are never in a spot where you're over uh, exposing yourself on these wagers and you keep your units to a very strict uh, you know, output total and you, you don't bet these tournaments where you don't have an edge, that's where you can take your edge back over these casinos. So always keep that in mind. I wouldn't go breaking the bank unless you know, if your model is saying something different than mine saying, then go for it. But unless you're in that spot, like don't bet just to bet. Very well said. Just because there's that late night Nevada versus Colorado state mountain West game doesn't mean you have to bet it. <laughs> uh, at least not for that much money. So that'll do it for us on today's episode. Thanks for joining us here at links and locks for more great golf content from our action network and golf bet team. Check out the Best Bets episode from earlier this week featuring Golf Bets' Jason Sobel and the PGA Tour's Ben Everill as they quickly run down their top 18 plays for the tournament each week. Be sure to check out actionnetwork.com and the Action app for all of our great golf betting and DFS content. Find us on Twitter. You can find Nick at StixPix, S-T-I-X-P-I-C-K-S. You can find Spencer at T-Off Sports, T-E-E-O-F-F-S-P-O-R-T-S. And then you can find me, Roberto Arguello at Roberto A213. Thanks again for joining us this week. Hope you find some nice Jason Day odds on Monday and you hit the green with your bets this week. 